It's the call up. And today oh, we have a really, really awesome guest. Maybe one of the hottest hitters in the minor leagues right now, LA angels organization, Michael Stefanik. Mike, thanks so much for taking the time. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you having me on and looking forward to it. Yeah. So, I mean, first and foremost, I got to congratulate you on what was just an amazing 2021. Uh, and then, of course, a great start to 2022 so far. So thanks again for uh, carving out some time during your your hot streak right now through the first 10 games. Uh, I want to read stats to the listeners before you get into it, because I want, I want you to talk kind of about what clicked for you last year. But just so people know, after you were promoted to AAA, which was 104 games that you played at that level, you slashed 334, 408, 505 with 16 home runs, 10% walk rate, 13% K rate. I mean, you, you can't ask for much more than that offensively. Uh, what really clicked for you last year? And uh, I mean, how fun was that ride? Oh, it was awesome. You know, getting to experience the AAA level was just phenomenal. There's so many just like veterans who have been there, done that in the show and just like being able to pick their brains. Um, honestly, the biggest thing that clicked for me last year was just, you know, the intent to do more damage. Um, I've always been a really high contact rate guy. And uh, kind of showing that again this year. But the biggest thing for me was just like picking my times to take my shots and when to, you know, try to hit homers and try to stretch the gaps a little bit. And you know, I really kind of started understanding how teams were pitching me and just really, you know, taking those shots at the right times paid off for me last year, for sure. I think that's something that's really cool to hit on because, you know, again, you can't really, you, I guess you can, but it's very hard to teach people to have a 90 plus percent zone contact rate. Like that's something that I feel like you can make the adjustments. You can make some optimizations to your swings and your movements. But at the end of the day, there's just like a level of bat to ball that is unteachable and you, and you have that, but in a game that is so driven by power uh, and impact, unless you're a gold glove defender or the fleetest of foot. Now, when did you, when did that kind of set in for you? Like, Hey, I need to do a little bit more damage. And how did you tow that line without compromising who you are because you're still a guy that puts the ball in play a ton and, you know, can spray the ball all over. Yeah. I mean, I really just, you know, talking with my hitting coaches coming up, um, you know, there's always, like you said, a fine line in between when to try to make contact and when to do some damage. But um, it really hit me after the, uh, the COVID year 2020. So I didn't really play. Um, I, I, I finished the, the 2019 season probably at like 165 pounds, like lost a lot of weight during the year, was very small, ended up gaining like 20 pounds of muscle during wow. the COVID year where I was just literally doing nothing but playing golf. That was about it. Um, so that was my big emphasis was just I've always had the high contact rate. So now it's about like maximizing that exit velocity with the contact rate. Um, so that really helped. I was on like a weighted bat program with the angels that um, kind of increased my bat speed too, which helped a lot. And, you know, it's really just always been one of those things for me. I know I'm going to put the ball in play, especially with two strikes. So um, like I said before, just kind of picking and choosing those spots and, you know, the types of pitches that I want to attack and try to drive as opposed to, you know, most of 2019, that was really my first full season in pro ball. I was just swinging to make contact and, uh, you know, like you said, fine line. So I really just kind of understood a little more nuance of the game and was able to, you know, take those shots at the right time. And, you know, I think there's a level of when you're getting acclimated in, into professional baseball, it's, it's almost survival, right? Like you just, you, you want to put the ball in play. You want to show that you belong. And uh, I feel like for you, even more so, you probably had that pressure a little bit, right? Because you weren't a, a, a first round pick or or somebody that is going to get all of the chances in the world, right? Like you knew you had to maximize your opportunity because it, it's just the nature of the business, right? If, if you're a million dollar signing bonus guy, you're yeah. going to get more chances than than the guys who went undrafted. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, first of all, your, your experience finally getting a chance? Because uh, the LA Times wrote a phenomenal piece on you. Uh, and just your whole story to, to where you are now on the cusp of a big league debut, hopefully sometime soon. Uh, but before that, it was not really being recruited that much, you know, and then even after you perform in college, not really getting too many calls about professional opportunities. Uh, can, can you talk a little bit about your journey to where you are now? And, uh, you know, did you always think that pro baseball could be an opportunity and, and something that could actually work out for you? 
Yeah, I mean, in short, no, I never really thought it was a possibility. I always knew people who did it. And, you know, it was a goal of mine to do that. But coming out of high school, my senior year, I broke my ankle in like my third game of high school senior year. So that was kind of the big recruiting point for me. And that all kind of got, you know, taken by the wayside there. Um, I walked on at an NAI school called Westmont in Santa Barbara. Um, I went into that fall as like the fourth second baseman on the depth chart, ended up hitting like 600 that fall. Um, Started all four years there um, was told junior and senior year by multiple teams that you know day three of the draft back when it was 40 rounds hey we're going to take you like if you're there we're going to take you um, so went through that for two years obviously went undrafted um, so at that point it was kind of back to the drawing board um, I had a girlfriend at the time former girlfriend um, her really good family friend worked in the front office of the the Padres so I, ha- I kind of had a sit down meeting with him and I was like hey dude like how do I you know, get my foot in the door and break into this pro ball world, because that's honestly half the battle truly oh. is just, there's so many good players who don't get those opportunities. And uh, he basically told me to, you know, draft up a baseball resume and uh, a little prospect video. It was almost like a college prospect oh video. It was so ne- bad. I I've never like heard iPad. of that. Yeah. So I, I went to my, drove home 14 hours from Santa Barbara to Idaho, kind of tried to figure out what was next. Uh, went to my local high school field. They were having summer ball there. Filmed like, uh, you know, me taking ground balls and hitting BP um, on my dad's iPad that he had at the time. And I literally sent probably 150, 200 emails um, to four or five different people in each Major League Baseball organization, just, you know, trying to hope for a shot. And uh, about half the teams responded that there was nothing available at that time, the Angels being one of those. And then, you know, I got an email from somebody with the angels that said, we don't have any at bats for you right now, but we'll keep you in mind if we need somebody. Um, ultimately somebody went down in the AZL, um, for the angels and they gave me a call and said, you know, how soon can you drive to Arizona? And I was like, I'll be there tomorrow. So I packed up all my stuff, drove to Arizona and yeah, hit 400 in rookie ball. And then here I am. That is insane. Yeah. Pretty crazy. That- that is unbelievable. Um, I mean, wow. I, I was not expecting that, that whole story. I, I hope everyone listening is like, as like moved by that as, as I, because for me, you know, I always dreamt of, of playing and, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, I obviously didn't have near the ability you had. And I tore my labrum and I was like, all right, I'm going to broadcast. You know, like, I didn't have that burning passion or that yeah. uh, I love baseball, but yeah, clearly, but I, I didn't have that. Like, there's just a different level of, I think, people like yourself that just find a way. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think it's one of the coolest things in the world because I, I would almost assure you 99.99% of people would have probably shifted because I think conventional thinking is, all right, let's 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 go find a career now. Yeah. And here you are, you found a career and you're on the cusp of, of a major league debut. So <laughs> congratulations to you on that. I mean, yeah, you, you. I've never heard of a recruiting video for professional baseball. Yeah. It's, you'd it's think, still on you'd, YouTube you'd think hitting 400 your senior year would, would do that for you. Yeah. I mean, for whatever reason, just, you know, the way these teams draft, it's like, it's a lot easier to, you know, take the risk on a power five guy who, you know, may not have the same level of stat- stats, but have seen that competition. Whereas, you know, it's a little harder to take the risk on a guy and, you know, spend ten, twenty thousand dollars on a guy coming out of a small school like that who's, you know, undersized, no power, you know, all the stuff that scouts have said about me and my career. So um, but yeah, I mean, I'm definitely glad I didn't take no for an answer, that's for sure. So that was actually gonna be my next question because I mean you're you're obviously a very humble guy, but how do you maintain that confidence in yourself when, you know, evaluators are saying, mm-hmm. eh, I don't know if this guy's you know, good enough to make it. Uh, teams are saying, ah, I don't know, man. Uh, and, and that's kind of the trend for you. But again, you were right. You are right. But how did you maintain that confidence in yourself when you have all those outside voices kind of doubting mm-hmm. your ability? Well, I kind of just, just as you said, that kind of made me think of that Michael Jordan meme from the last dance where it was like, and I took that personally. Yeah. yeah. So like, I, I kind of use that as fuel, but also like when it comes to game time, like 
whether it's the big leagues, whether it's, you know, rookie ball, whether it's college, whether it's high school, the pitcher's got to throw the ball over the plate. And if he throws the ball over the plate, I got to, I have a chance to hit it. So really I kind of just approach every day, whether it's spring training, whether it's, you know, triple a, whether, you know, freeway series in Dodger stadium, like the moment really has never been too big for me. And I'm always just been confident in my ability to put the bat on the ball. And, you know, like I said, he's got to throw it over the plate. Let's see who wins. So that's kind of really just how I approach things day to day. That's, that's awesome. Because again, it's something in the game now where, I really feel like baseball and sports in general are very cyclical, right? And and we've gone so far one way, which is, you know, swing and miss three true mm-hmm. outcomes. You hear it all the time. I don't think it's as detrimental as, as people think and yeah. try and make it out to be. But if you're trying to balance a lineup out, I think we've seen now time and time again, if you have too many of the same kind of guy, that three true outcome guy, it's, it's tough to win games. At least as far as I'm seeing now, I start to see that importance of, the bat to ball guys, of course, you still got to be able to hit 15, 20. And you did that last year. Like you're not going to be able to hit two home runs anymore. So that that's never going to quite be the same, but now you're hitting those 15, 20. You talked about how you were able to do that. Uh, Was there any challenge of adapting to the triple a level? I know that the baseballs are different. So did that aid you at all with the power? Like some gappers turned into homers, but also at the same time, these guys are executing pitches better. Maybe they're not giving into you in the hitters counts as you're talking about, you know, picking your spots to do damage. Yeah. Maybe in high A, it's a guaranteed fastball. Not the case, maybe in triple A. What was that learning curve like once you got up to triple? Totally. It was just like, and, you know, I had, a, luckily I had a lot of good veteran players on my team last year, you know, Drew Butera, John Jay, guys like that. You could just sit down and talk with about the game, which was awesome. And I would say the baseball that like helps, helps a little bit, but it's not really as much as you would think, like, especially, you know, we're dealing with it out here in April right now. It's cold. The ball goes nowhere. So like, it's kind of just, everybody plays in the same environment. So I've never, I've never really quite understood the whole like PCL, you know, hit, it is a hitters league, but it's like, you still got to hit it. So I would say a couple, you know, a couple homers last year, or doubles turned into homers last year just because of the baseball and whatever. But, you know, it's really just about, you know, putting good swings on good pitches. And that's, that's really my entire hitting philosophy. It's never like what's going wrong with my swing. The first thing I look at is like, am I swinging at good pitches? So that's really what I learned. And, you know, I study tendencies and tend to base my, you know, game plan off of tendencies by the pitcher. So just like understanding myself and what I do well, and then also understanding at the same time what I'm not good at and just kind of trying to lay off those pitches. Cause that's, in my opinion, that's the biggest key to hitting in general is just like take the pitches you're bad at hitting, even if they're strikes and then swing at the pitches you're good at hitting. So it, that's pretty funny. much it in a nutshell. It's funny because it sounds so overly simple but it really is something that is, is kind of making its way as a wave through the game as well. If we're talking about trends, you know, Codify, Michael Fisher, uh, the founder of Codify is, was a guy that uh, hopped on the just baseball show recently. And it was pretty cool to just talk to him. We're like, what's your, what's your big complex philosophy? Of course, there's a lot more to it, but he said, if really to boil it down, it's hunt the blue zones, uh, throw your better pitches more and your worst pitches less or for hitters, you know, kind of what you were saying. And, and it's really wild that, it's something that I think we've seen kind of take shape more. So now again, a little bit of a simplification of what became almost overcomplicated uh, in the game. So for, for you, the bat has been there, right? Like, I don't think there's much question about the bat, but the other thing that you were getting, you know, some, I guess just some like questions on about for your big long-term outlook in the big leagues was, was the defense, right? Like where does he slot? Where do you end up? And, you yep. took that and over the off season really focused on working on, on that agility, right. And, and kind of being able to play other spots. Can you talk a little bit about that and uh, w- what your focuses were defensively and, and how you tried to make yourself more adept to be able to, to play all over the field? Totally. Um, so I think the biggest thing for me this off season was getting healthy. Um, a lot of people what, what they don't know is I was dealing with a pretty severe lower leg injury last year, the whole year, which 
limited my range and my mobility. So that's honestly been the biggest thing for me. Um, but I spent all off season in Tempe at the angels facility, you know, just getting right. You know, if there's a silver lining of not getting put on that 40 man roster and being locked out, it was that, you know, ability to go into the facility every day and get the treatment and the PT and the, the workouts with the strength staff that I needed to. And we really focused on, you know, sprint speed, running mechanics and agility just to, you know, range up and get those balls that I wasn't getting to last year. Um, and then I've also worked really hard this spring on a, a, a kind of a new prep step in the infield to kind of get me more on time with the pitch, you know, while it's in the hitting zone. And, you know, I feel like that's already paid off um, quite a bit. I'm getting to a lot more baseballs that I otherwise wouldn't have last year, you know, whether it's, you know, the injury, whether it's just me not reading swings well enough, but, you know, all that's come. And I think, Joe Madden was quoted saying something that I really agree with. And he, he basically said during spring training, he didn't see why that was the knock on me. And I really agree with that. I mean, I won five gold gloves in college in four years. Um, so I really don't, you know, defense has never been something that I've struggled with. Um, so, you know, my mentality is the same. Everything's really the same. I've adjusted my pre-pitch, but, you know, just being healthy will allow me to get to a lot more of those baseballs that I did last year. Yeah. And, and I love that, you know, you're, you're able to kind of speak on that. And, and that's the thing too, is uh, you were playing shortstop in the early going of your professional mm -hmm. career, right? I mean, like, and, and even if it's not in double or triple, like you're playing shortstop, I think you're, you're capable of, of playing second or third. And yeah. as you mentioned, not getting healthy was big too. Uh, how has the the experience at third been a little bit? Because as far as I know, that wasn't somewhere you played as much. And they've gotten a couple starts there. Uh, yeah. how, how have you adjusted there? Because uh, it's, it's different, right? The ball comes at you a little bit quicker. Sure. It's a longer throw. It's different arm slot. Like, how, how has that been for you adjusting there? I think it's fine. I feel like my uh, second's my primary position. I feel like that's where I project long term in the big leagues if I were to stick at one spot. But third would definitely be the, the second most confident place I am at right now. Um, I worked really hard in the offseason with one of our coaches doing a, a weighted ball program for my arm. So I feel like that's helped a lot with just the carry across the diamond. And honestly, I really like third because it's, it's such a forward and back position where up the middle you're going left and right so much that it's like, at third, it's really like, okay, do I go get that short hop or do I take a couple steps back and get that long hop? And, you know, the throw is whatever to me, as long as I get my feet set, I feel like I can throw it just fine. So um, I feel comfortable there. And, you know, hopefully whenever the angels need me, I'll be ready no matter what. So you talked about the, uh, some of the players in AAA, some of the big league vets like John Jay and Drew Butera mm -hmm. and some others that, you know, we're able to kind of impact and be just a, a resource for you. Was there anybody else uh, at the spring training or any other big leaguers or anybody that you, you've come across that has really been a, a, oh my gosh, it's this guy. And also anybody that was just really helpful for you. Yeah. I mean, anytime you get to watch Shohei Otani and Mike Trout take BP, I was in there. So first day of big league camp, I was in their hitting group. And I don't think I've ever felt more emasculated in my entire <laughs> life. These guys are hitting balls over the, the, the training room and right field. And I'm just like slapping doubles and homers around like barely wall scraping over. So, you know, that's, that's an awesome experience getting to play with those guys, of course, two of the best in the game. Um, Anthony Rendon, I talked to him a little bit about third base and then obviously, you know, Fletch up the middle is incredible. And so just getting to talk with him quite a bit and pick his brain about little things like the prep step or, you know, double play feeds or whatever it is. I, th I think that's huge. And, um, but I'm pretty confident in my hitting philosophy. I, ha I haven't really changed that in a long time. So um, you take, you take bits and pieces of what, what guys have to say, but you know, if you don't stick to something you're confident in, you're not going to do very well in the box. Are there any uh, other aspects to your hitting philosophy that, you may be comfortable sharing without giving too much of the blueprint of yeah. how to get Michael Stefanik out, which is already very <laughs> tough to do already. So um, yeah. yeah. Any, any other, like, I know you've gotten into it a little bit, but I don't know if there's any other aspects to your hitting approach. Cause that's something we always like to get into on this podcast. Yeah, I mean, I always like to get in the head of, of, of hitters yeah, or pitchers. For the, for the most part, I'm on the fastball until it's time not to, you know, um, I, I have a really good ability to recognize spin and all that stuff. So my, my end zone swings really good. And I, 
I don't chase very much, but really that comes from just setting my sights to a fastball that I want to hit and reacting elsewhere. I mean, as simple as that sounds, there's so much information available to us now, even at AAA, like obviously in the big leagues, it's a totally different level, but you know, the scouting reports we get in every day are so in depth that it's like, if you don't have a simple approach, you're just going to drive yourself crazy with all these numbers. So you know, I I like to understand, you know, how much arm side run he has or how much vertical break he's got on his heater. And, you know, everything comes from the heater. And if you can't, if you can't hit a heater, you're in trouble because obviously that's, that's the pitch that most guys throw the most often. So everything starts with that. So so I was looking at the numbers uh, from combining from this season going into last season as well. Uh, Mm -hmm. 323 against fastballs, 358 against breaking balls, and 340 against changeups. Um, were you aware of that? <laughs> no, I had no idea until you just told me. I always knew I crushed breaking balls, but I mean, oh yeah, that's... And the slugging on breaking balls is is the highest by far, 576. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, it might be missing a few a few plays here and there, but I, I think that's one of those things that when I look at, at prospects, you know, we're doing prospect analysis or whatever, and you see a guy that's, that's putting up numbers against every kind of pitch. That's, that's somebody that, you know, is comfortable in the box, right? Like, yeah. And when things are going poorly for you, which has not been very often in a, or not for a very long time, but baseball mm-hmm. is still a roller coaster of a sport for even the of best. Course. What is usually the challenge for you? Cause you have the simple approach. So when things are yeah. going poorly, what is usually off for you? Um, you know, what's usually off for me is I, when I, when I start going poorly, I start hooking a lot of ground balls to shortstop. And really that stems from just like my posture as a hitter. I try to think about like almost getting my chest over the plate. And so I can turn underneath these breaking balls and heaters and that'll, that'll get my direction better going towards center field. Um, Yeah. That's my worst habit is just spinning off everything and just like hard ground balls, the third or short. Um, that's the biggest thing. And then if I'm not seeing it well, which happens to everybody, um, I really just try to shrink the zone. Um, you know, a lot of guys try to expand it and swing more. I honestly try to swing less just because I make so much contact. I almost have to be, be more disciplined than other hitters because if I swing, chances are I'm going to put it in play. It may not be hard, but I'm going to put it in play. So I almost try to just shrink the zone and just hunt the pitch that I'm looking for. And if it's anything else, just let it go. I think that's a really good point because that's something I always try to talk about with, with approach in general, right? We see a lot of high end hit tool guys, excuse me, that end up chasing a lot. And it's like, okay, wait, they're high end hit tool, but they chase a lot. And I get a lot of questions about that. I'm like, cause you have this overwhelming confidence that you can put the bat on anything, but just because you can put the bat on it doesn't mean that's good. Right. You might be better exactly. off taking a strike than rolling over to third base. Um, so it's really interesting to hear you talk about that. And I think it all kind of ties back into leveraging those hitters counts. Uh, mm-hmm. What would be like one word of advice uh, you would give to, to a young hitter, maybe going into high school and now starting to face that, that tougher competition. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, as someone that's kind of seen it all that's had to, to grind his way through, but just in general, from like a basic hitter hitters perspective, what would you tell a high schooler that's going in to face some tough competition? Jeez, that's a, that's a good question. Um, let's see. I'd say the biggest thing is just like understanding that failure happens in baseball and it's going to happen more times than not. So just this is such a mental game and it's so, it's so much about confidence in the box that it's like if you beat yourself up over one or two or three bad at bats, you're going to be in trouble because you're going to get about 500 more of them in a minor league season or a major league season. And if that's your ultimate goal, like what's one, you know, three strikeout day in the grand scheme of things, you know? So it's just about being able to handle adversity. And I think part of that is just like being a good teammate and finding joy in like your teammate success. So even if you're not having a good day, supporting your teammates and being there for them, will ultimately lead to you doing that in the future. That's, I think that's the best piece of advice there. Cause I always remember going, going back to high school, you win the game, but one guy has a bad game and he's over there pouting like that. Yeah. That's usually not going to be good for you long-term with your teammates. And also with, with the way you approach the game and just uh, your overall well-being mentally, because it is, 
a game that will wear at you if you let it without a doubt. And I can imagine from the minor league grind, it can wear at you even more. So Uh, one last question on, on that side of things, you are right on the cusp, right? And I mean, you can only control the controllable and you're doing that right now Mm -hmm. by, by hitting, right? Like that's all you can do is hit defend and, and wait. But I mean, you, I've got yourself in a position here where you're, you've never been closer to the big leagues, right? And I, Mm -hmm. uh, not to, to talk about it too much, but you know, how do you balance that? Because you don't want to try to do too much. I know, I know for sure. That's definitely not what you want to do, but you still won't have that pressure to, to put up numbers. Cause you're so close. Uh, well, how do you balance that? Um, I think the biggest thing is just, it's the most cliche thing in the book, but just like day by day, it's like, you may go four for four one day, but over oh five the next. And it's just like, how do you balance that? I've always been a, a very consistent player and I pride myself on, you know, doing that and being a consistent, you know, hitter in the lineup and defender. So it's just like, like I was talking about earlier, being able to flush the bad days, but almost more importantly, being able to flush the good days and just not thinking that I, I, I heard this quote one time and is, is really good. And it's, you're never as good as you think you are. And you're never as bad as you think you are. So it's just like being able to stay and minimize the peaks and the valleys of this game, because there's so many of them. And it's just, you know, approaching that and just playing consistently every day is huge, especially in baseball, because there's so many games. And, you know, if I can do that, you know, I kind of just at this point in my career, like, I'm, I still feel like I'm playing with house money. Like if you had told me at 18 years old that I would be 26 and being one step away from the big leagues, I would have called you a lunatic. So, you know, I, I still try to put things in perspective every day and I love my job. I love going out and playing and being with my teammates in the clubhouse every day. And I really do enjoy it. So, you know, it's about enjoying every day that you get to go to the ballpark. And when that call comes, like I'll be ready no matter what. So and, that's and how I look at it. I, and I think that's the best way to put it. And when that call does come, you know, what, what will angels fans be getting from, from Michael Stefanik? What kind of player are they getting? Yeah. Consistency. I think, I'm going to show up every day and play as hard as I can. And I'm going to dust myself off and do it the next day. Um, I'm the type of guy that'll give you three to four quality at bats a night. And I'm going to field my position when the balls hit at me. And, you know, I want, I want to help win ball games. I want to go on a postseason run. I want to, you know, help Trout and Otani get the, those playoff wins that they've been talking about so much. So, you know, it's really, I want to be a part of something big and, you know, it's been 20 years almost on the dot since the angels won a world series. And I want to be a part of that. And I want to go on a deep playoff run. So I don't care about my numbers. I don't care if I play every day. I don't care if I play against lefties. If I play against righties, I don't care. I just want to be up there and be part of it and, you know, be a part of that major league, you know, fraternity. Please help get Mike Trout to the playoffs. Uh, that, that's, that's that's all right. I ask. That's all I ask. I mean, uh, no, the Angels. This I was. We were just talking about it on the Just Baseball show um, about this is the best iteration I think of the Angels we've seen since maybe 2012, which was mm-hmm. a team that won 90 something games. I mean, yeah. this is a really good team, but as you know, you can't have enough infield depth. You can't have enough, you know, bats in your lineup, and and things mm-hmm. happen. Um, so I, I know you're going to get that opportunity sooner rather than later. And uh, I know that everybody that listened to this podcast is, is going to be rooting for you because this was a, an awesome interview and, and an awesome story, uh, by the way. I mean, I, I don't think I can I can really explain that enough, but it's really incredible how, how far you've come and how much you still have to go. Like how much how much you're still going to do uh, is, is really exciting. And I'm excited to follow along the rest of this year. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad you know, I was able to share this stuff with you and your audience. So yeah, I'm stoked to, uh, you know, I'm ready. I'm ready. So we, we got to run it back if you're up for it uh, after the, uh, after the big league call up or after you're hitting 450 two months into the season. Uh, but <laughs> Absolutely. I'm down. Uh, I'm but down. I, yeah. So much fun, man. I really appreciate the time and really look forward to you getting that call up sometime soon. Thank you. I appreciate it.